This video is sponsored by Squarespace. What's your name? Someone with a fleshy appearance, with large wormy lips and long hair and pale eyes. He is an anomaly. Your fans on the internet are saying that you look like you're disappointed in someone. <laughs> you do absolutely horrible person incredibly well. Who's into domination. <laughs> Alternately sweet, but also creepy. Everyone's claiming you're the internet's boyfriend. Are you a psychologist too, or a magician? It's all on Killian. It's Killian. It's pronounced Killian. As critics and select audience members filed into the AMC Lincoln Square Theater in New York City on a rather warm summer day, excitement was in the air. This was an event four years in the making to answer the many questions left since Christian Bale's Batman became the Dark Knight and disappeared into the dark of Gotham City in 2008. At the Dark Knight Rises premiere on July 17, 2012, Killian Murphy made his way up to the IMAX theater at the very top of the building. Back in 2004, director Christopher Nolan had cast him as the villain Scarecrow after Killian had auditioned for the role of Batman. Who was with Falcone at the docks? She murdered my parents and they deserve- Don't pretend you wanted to do this for them. All those years later, and after two appearances in the Dark Knight trilogy and a large role in another Nolan film, Inception, Killian had earned the trust of the usually secretive director who asked, you want to read the script? Killian replied, you know what, I don't actually want to read the script. Just tell me what I'm doing. Just tell me what my motivation is, and then I want to see the movie. I didn't want to spoil it, so I just came in for that one day and that little bit on that amazing set, and then waited to see the movie, and it was worth it. And while some will argue whether or not the final film of the trilogy was worth the wait, Killian Murphy was still waiting for another milestone to occur in his career. I can't remember which director said it, but he said it takes 30 years to make a good actor, Killian said. Longevity matters. I'm 16 years in, just over the hump, and when I'm 50, I should know if I've mastered my trade or failed glorious. In his early years, Killian had a fairly eclectic set of interests that he would try and pursue as a career, from playing in a band and almost signing a record deal, studying law at the University College Cork, before gaining an interest in acting during his time at the university, which would lead to his first professional gig. The first audition I did was for a, for a play in Cork. And it was for this play called Disco Pigs. So that was the first ever professional part I had, and then three years later, they made a movie of the play. I had never ever envisaged ever being in a film or being on television or anything like that, I, was, I wanted to be a theater actor. And it wasn't the first film I'd done, but it was the first film I did, I suppose, that people took any notice of. I'd like to thank my best love in the whole wide world, without whom none of me would be possible. And uh, I have a lot of affection for that character because it was the first role I ever played. The disco dance, and we moved the wet spit about the face. For an industry that seems to be filled to the brim with actors and actresses competing for lead roles and to be the next breakout A-list star, Killian has sought to avoid this path as much as possible, staying mostly away from the Hollywood culture and fast-paced lives, attending, begrudgingly, only his movie premieres, and avidly avoiding an appearance in the tabloids. But beyond a personal enjoyment of having a quiet, private life apart from his work, he also believes it allows him to be a more effective actor. I don't really like talking about myself. <laughs> So I'm gonna talk about other people if that's okay. I've always felt that the less the public knows about you, the more effective you can be when you go to portray someone else, he says. I don't like talking about myself so much. Oh, I see, I see. You so want to keep some more. Right. Make him talk about himself. He pulled you into this for a reason, you know? For actors to reveal so much about themselves and allow their personal selves to be owned by the media and the public, I find at odds with trying to lose yourself in a character. And that's the thing I'm after. That's what drives me. After his debut in Disco Pigs, Killian would continue on to star in several short films, Irish indie films, and an appearance in BBC Television's miniseries adaptation of The Way We Live Now. Cattle, property, roads and bridges, string of the telegraph, way up into the Sierras. 
But as Disco Pigs gained traction and popularity, it came across the desk of casting director Gail Stevens, who at the time was working with English director Danny Boyle on casting for the upcoming film 28 Days Later. Hello! He had a dreamy, slightly de-energized, floating quality that is fantastic for the film, Gail recalled from watching Killian's work as an actor. Hello! Yeah, we wanted people that weren't really known. We didn't really want stars to be in it. So we phoned this guy, Killian Murphy, this Irish actor. And it's, it's easy to find inexperienced actors who haven't got much track record. But of course, the danger is that they won't be able to carry the film. And they've done a wonderful job because they've been able to actually... You, you experience and you get carried through the whole film by these two. 28 Days would later go on to be a sleeper hit in the US, giving Killian Murphy wide exposure for the first time in his career and winning a couple of awards along the way for his work. It was this performance that would spark the start of a long-standing partnership between this young up-and-coming actor and a young director who was also on the rise. Actors and creatives in general had a rather difficult time generating any attention back in the early 2000s. But thanks to modern times and our sponsor Squarespace, gone are the days of trying to show off your unique style and brand through complex coding and frustrating old websites that just don't work. With Squarespace's Fluid Engine, you can just click, drag, and drop elements wherever you want, allowing you to configure your own template or customize one of their many beautiful template designs filled with galleries to showcase your work or even help you schedule clients or auditions. Head to squarespace.com slash framevoyager to save 10% off your first purchase of website or domain using the code framevoyager. Killian Murphy is one of the great actors of his generation, and, and I was very fortunate to start working with him very early in his career. The first time I met him, just to give you a bit of context, was I had just done 28 Days Later, and it, and it had come out in America, and it, it made a bit of money, and it kind of done all right. Yeah. And then Chris had seen it, I think, and we met in Los Angeles, and we sat down, and we just talked about, about movies. Killian would come and initially audition for the leading role of Bruce Wayne. But as we mentioned previously, both he and Christopher Nolan knew that he wasn't right for the part of Batman. But the performance was incredible and everybody took huge notice of it while we were shooting it and while we watched the test. I felt like this is someone I want to create with, this is someone I want to work with. But to get Murphy onto the project, Christopher Nolan would have to convince Warner Brothers executives to allow him to play another role, breaking from traditional Batman films where well-known actors play major roles or side characters in the film. I then was able to go to the studio and ask to, to put him in as, as Crane a scarecrow in, in Batman Begins. Even though traditionally in past iterations of Batman films, they'd always insisted on as big a star as possible, playing the sort of fanciful villains. Having seen Killian's test, they were very, very happy to put him in there. This was the start of a long relationship between the two, and one where Christopher Nolan began to see the possibilities of where Killian Murphy's acting talents and expressive eyes could take a film. Nolan said he has the most extraordinary eyes, and I kept trying to invent excuses for him to take his glasses off in close-ups. Christopher Nolan says he loves your eyes, a reporter from The Guardian remarked to Killy Murphy. That's very nice of him, he says, not looking up. You must get that a lot, the reporter pressured, trying to find an opening. Occasionally, the uncomfortable actor said, it's not something I think about too much, to be honest. The first thing many notice with Killian Murphy are his eyes. They are hard to miss with how visually striking they appear on screen and the repeated ways directors and cinematographers have found to use them to a film's advantage over the years. But just like the interview with The Guardian reporter, Killian has repeatedly pushed back or has been self-effacing about his eyes whenever they're mentioned, in a way appearing to not want to allow that to cheapen the performance. Killian's just incredible. And, look at him and staring at us right look now. At him just, look at just give me these eyes. Looking, he's looking at me. He's looking at me. <laughs> um, he's, he's like the Mona Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> Many actors gain popularity with their looks or visually interesting aspects about themselves and in some ways stagnate and rely on just those attributes to successfully guide them to a lucrative career, you could say. Though Killian Murphy frequently denies thinking about them, you can tell that he has developed them to be more than just visually appealing over the years. The important thing isn't can you read music, it's can you hear it. Can you hear the music, Robert? 
I really wanted to concentrate on who the real people were while I was putting the script together. Especially when I'm dealing with a real life figure. Of I want to write with Oppenheimer in mind. But then when you finish and you're looking at the cover of American Prometheus, the book that I was adapting, and there's this picture of Oppenheimer, this intense blue-eyed stare on the front, and I thought, I know who can do that. I know you can do that. While Killian Murphy seemed to be a match made in heaven for Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, it was the years leading up to the film and the progress he made as an actor that allowed him, 27 years into his career, to master his trade beyond that piercing blue-eyed stare. And perhaps no other role prepared him to play the part of Oppenheimer than the show Peaky Blinders. In the case of Peaky Blinders, Killian Murphy plays the character of Thomas Shelby, a cruel character who fights for the oppressed, but also is traumatized by his involvement in World War I. His character often chooses to listen instead of speak, often in a very stoic demeanor, with his eyes often informing how he's thinking and his decision making in any given scene. Because of this, Killian would have to find other ways to show you what the character's thinking about behind this rigid demeanor. From eye flickering when he's with his love interest in the film, to his stoic performance explaining to his son that his mother has died, while conveying an internal emotion subtly through his eyes. In some ways, it would be easier for an actor to be over the top in conveying their emotions and of course more flashy for those award-winning aspirations. But throughout Killian Murphy's career, his ability to derive just as much weight, meaning, and emotion from measured performances made him a perfect fit for Oppenheimer, more than just his eyes being piercingly blue. Honestly, what more can be said about the Oppenheimer film that hasn't already been said? The performance of taking the Oppenheimer character from a troubled but highly intuitive student with a look of wonder, to a cocky young professor, to a stoic figure doing what must be done, to a character whose haunted look is enough to tap into one's own fears of the reality of a world with nuclear weapons. And yet, this was achieved without the loud performance of Maestro, the fake teeth of Killers of the Flower Moon, the absurdity of poor things, or the death-defying stunts of Mission Impossible. It's a disciplined, subtle performance, his part crucial to carrying the film and maintaining the attention of the audience for three hours. And it's a movie that likely falls apart without that performance. And his ability to make the performance not about himself, unlike other biopic films this year, shows a maturity that comes from an actor not concerned with winning awards or becoming the next star of Hollywood but perfecting his craft and embodying his character in a way that who he is doesn't distract from the character he's playing on screen. Fulfilling his 2012 goal of mastering the trade of acting three years early. When I'm 50, I should know if I've mastered my trade or failed gloriously. And if you're interested in seeing something that failed gloriously, check out our video on Zack Snyder's Visual Fallacy 300 to Rebel Moon right here.